Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to I'm going to probably teach more than preach. Uh, the next few maybe the next few Sundays we'll see how far it goes. I make the mistake, and I've done it before, of assuming that everybody who's here in church and everybody that's watching online is already saved. And that may not be the case. My goal with this is not necessarily to get you to question your salvation, but I think it is healthy every now and then that you ask the question, am I saved? Am I saved? You know, we get caught up in politics. We get caught up in the news affairs that we see and hear every day. Things that come across our feed in Facebook and things that people try to share with us about this, about COVID, about politics, about this, you know, everything that's going on in the world. And I'm telling you, the most important thing ever in your life is that you know beyond any shadow of any doubt that when you die you are going to heaven Uh, a few Sundays ago if you remember I shared about the pastor who got caught up in some very bad wicked sins and He died, apparently, in those sins. Now, I'm not his judge, and I've mentioned him in about two or three different messages since that happened. And I've tried to be careful not to say he's in hell right now, this and that and the other. But the problem is, I don't know where he is. And when I die, I've asked God, and I still do this. God, when it's my turn to die, I want to know where I'm going. And I want to know, I don't, I don't want to just know where I'm going. I want to know I'm going to heaven when I die. You can say, well, you're a preacher. Obviously, you know. I just talked about a preacher that I don't know where he is. His sins overcame him in his life whether he was even saved to begin with I don't know I don't know the man don't know anything about him other than what I read in that in the news deals you can be member of a church and not be saved you can be supposedly in the ministry and not be saved Uh, I remember hearing one of my uh, one of my favorite gospel singers, a man by the name of Mark Trammell, he grew up in church. He grew up in a Baptist church, Southern Baptist Church down in Little Rock, Arkansas. His dad was the pastor. And he got into, he's very good at music, got into gospel music at a young age. And if you were to name the top groups that have ever been in gospel music since the 1970s, the Kingsmen, the Cathedrals, Gold City, Greater Vision... He was in all four of those groups, and now he's got his own group, the Mark Trammell Quartet. He admitted, he admitted in a videotape that they had made for their, when he was, this is after he left the cathedrals, that while he was with the cathedrals, they were playing golf in uh, Dell City, Oklahoma, that God had been dealing with him, and the pastor of the, the church there they were singing at, First Baptist in Dell City, Oklahoma, went to him out on the golf course and, and took him aside and began to talk to him. And, he, and he, he said, it was right then I realized that I had been living in church, I grew up in church, I had been singing gospel music and trying to live for the Lord and was lost and was dying and I was going to go to hell. And he said, I got saved. I didn't wait till we got done playing golf. I got saved on the third tee box of that golf course. I was not going to leave that place until God had dealt with me and I knew I was saved. And I've I've always appreciated him being honest about that, that you can pretend to serve God 
and say all the right. I, I've watched him from before that time. And he pretends to be like he's a Christian. He's saying all the right things and doing all the right things. And, and my, it looks like God's blessing. He was just as lost as lost could be. But God finally saved him. And then later on he surrendered to preach. And I appreciate that about him. Preachers can be lost. Deacons can be lost. Church trustee members can be lost. Church members can be lost. Sunday school teachers can be lost. Entire churches can be lost and dying and will all go to hell. This is the most important thing you will ever do in your life. Is to know beyond any shadow of a doubt that you're going to heaven when you die. In Ephesians chapter 6, do you have your Bible open there? Say amen. I'll give you a couple of minutes to open your Bible up and open it up, and then I'll ask you again, do you have your Bibles open to Ephesians 6? Do you have your Bible open to Ephesians 6? There's a few more of you. Because you cannot get saved by what Mike Hoggard tells you. It is impossible. My mouth is corrupt. What I will say are corrupt words. What God says is never corrupt. That's how you can be saved. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. And I would say that especially when it comes to the rulers of the darkness of this world, one of their prime positions, one of their prime things to do with people is to keep them in darkness so that they never, ever know whether or not they're born again or not. They will keep them in darkness. They are the rulers over darkness. And as long as they're the rulers over darkness and if they are ruling over your life, they will always keep your mind shrouded and you will never, ever, ever know whether or not you're born again. So he said, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. I started this series of sermons uh, several weeks ago. Uh, last Sunday, I, I didn't... Uh, I didn't preach this, Brother Doyle Williams. And by the way, it's a great message. Amen. You want me to have Doyle back? He said he'd never come back. I don't know if he's mad at us or what, but if y'all want me to, I can have him come back. Amen. It's good preaching. And, um, but it's been a while since I've been back into this, this particular series. He said in verse 14, Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith. And I, was, I had actually another sermon, another message that I was going to kind of branch off from that this morning. But I think the Holy Ghost kind of took over and said, No, I want you to do this. Wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now verse 17, And take the helmet of salvation. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And my question to you this morning is, have you taken the helmet of salvation? You're fighting, let's say, that, let's say that these devils, principalities, powers, let's just talk about powers for a minute. Powers are types of devils that, that's exactly what they say, they hold power over people. Whatever they want you to do, you will do. In Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 2, Paul said that when you're lost, you're following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And whatever that spirit wants you to do, you'll do. If it wants you to dance, you'll dance. If it wants you to fall down, you'll fall down. If it wants you to curse, you'll curse. If it wants you to commit adultery, you'll commit adultery. Whatever that spirit wants out of you, you have absolutely no control over it and you never will. You never will. You can listen to all the power positive thinking uh, books and tapes that there are out there. You can go to psychologists and psychotherapists and you can take medicines. And you can do all these things. But if you are not saved, you will never, ever have power over your sin. You will never have power over your sin. And your sin will destroy you. They have power over you. If those spirits, those gods, those devils, if they want you to drink, you'll drink. And I mean alcohol, beer, wine, whiskey. 
vodka. If they want you to drink that, you'll drink it. If they want you to suck on cigarettes, you'll suck on cigarettes. If they want you to take drugs, you'll take drugs. If they want you to chase women or men, you'll be out chasing women or men. Whatever it is that they are provoking and prodding you to do, you'll do because they control you. They have power over you. You don't have power over them. And you never will as long as you're lost. You never ever will have power over them as long as you're lost. So he said, take the helmet of salvation. We talked about the shield of faith. What is the shield guard? It guards this area here. Guard the heart. Right here I'm talking about guarding the mind. The helmet of salvation guards and protects our minds. Yes. And, and if you want to, you can picture that as a tinfoil hat. Especially after I'm talking about going to a UFO conference. But take the helmet of salvation. So I'm going to teach some things relevant to the doctrine of salvation. So let's go to prayer and then we'll talk about what's up on the screen. Heavenly Father, I'm asking for your help today to preach this message. I don't think I can. In my own power and in my own wisdom, my own thoughts, I know I cannot teach it right. And I pray, dear God, that you would open up our eyes and help us to see, Father, what you would have us to see. Help us to give us understanding, give us light. And Father, maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe there's somebody sitting here today that's lost. They have never, they do not and cannot remember the day. When they fell before the cross of Jesus Christ and begged for your mercy. They don't, they've never had that experience. They've never been to Calvary. They've never come to the cross. They've never asked for your free pardon of their sins. And right now they don't know where they're going to spend eternity. And Father, there's been times you've been with me, Father. You know you were there. When I've asked out loud, God, am I saved? Father, I'm just as afraid, if not more afraid of hell than I was when I was a little boy. And as the years of my life become less and less. I know there's coming a day when I'm going to stand not before these people and not before anybody out there, and not, certainly not before the lost crowd of this world. I'm going to stand before you and you're going to judge me righteously. And Father, I've said a lot of things wrong. I've done a lot of things wrong. I've been wrong about a lot of ideas, a lot of philosophies, a lot of things in my life I've been wrong about. I don't want to be wrong about this one. If I'm to be wrong about everything else that I say in this world, God, please don't let me be wrong about whether I'm saved. So, Father, teach us. Help us, dear God, to wear the setting would be that you would be here behind this pulpit teaching your people about how you save lost people and not me. So, Father, I will gladly move out of the way and let Jesus be the preacher today. Let him be the teacher. Let the Holy Spirit be the guide and let your word, Father, settle all the issues and all the arguments. We ask your blessings on your word. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Here's what, I just wrote some things down last night, what salvation is not. Salvation is not church membership. In fact, there are some people who are sitting in this room today who are probably not actual, physical, name written in the book, members of our church. Did you know that that doesn't matter really to me? I don't push church membership on people. I don't say, hey, you need to be a you know, member. You know, I want you to be, we need more members. And boy, we're having a membership drive. We want everybody. I, I, I'm just not me because to me, it's not important whether your name's written down here. It's important to me whether your name's written in heaven or not. But I, you know, I used to hear preaching all the time when I was young 
that, you know, you can't be, you, 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 you may be lost and be a church member. And I'm going, how does people think that way? Well, there's actually church doctrinal statements. To where if you memorize their catechism and you say all, give all the answers right or most of the answers right and you're sprinkled and you submit to joining the church when they sign your name in and put your name down as a member of such and such church according to them you're going to heaven and that's a lie. You could be lost as Charles Manson. Is he still alive? Did he die? Y'all remember who Charles Manson is, right? You could be as lost as Charles Manson, but have your name written down in some church membership role. I've met and talked to people, and, you know, do you go to church anywhere? Well, we have our membership back Home where I grew up, it's about 250 miles down that way. We got our membership down there. That's not what I asked. When you stand before God, he's not going to ask you, where is your church membership? We're trying to find the books now. We can't find it. Uh-oh. Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Salvation is not church membership. Salvation is not given or administered by any earthly organization. I cannot tell you whether you're saved or not. This church does not vote on your salvation. It does not have a meeting. Say, well, when do you discuss whether so and so is saved or not? We cannot do that. We cannot grant you salvation. We cannot take away your salvation. We cannot administer it to you. There, we don't have a ritual book that says if you do this, 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 and do this, then you are saved. We have nothing like that, and no church can tell you whether or not you're saved. You're not saved by catechism, baptism, monetary donations, and yes, there are people who believe that. Let me tell you what salvation also is not. Salvation is also is not an excuse that you can go out and send all you want to because you're saved. Let me tell you what was holding my dad back. For years. Was that he went to church when he was little. And went down forward and somebody led him through a prayer. And he thought that was it. And he used that as an excuse. For years he used that as an excuse why he would not come to church. Because he was told by brother so-and-so back in 1948 that he was saved and that's all he needed. Salvation is not an excuse or a license to sin without any repercussions from God whatsoever. And sad to say there are a lot of people who believe that. A lot of people who believe that. Salvation is also not an automatic healing of all your diseases, nor will it give you instantaneous wealth. And there are a lot of people who have equated physical healing with salvation, saying if you're sick, you're not saved, and if you're saved, you should never be sick. By the way, the guy that started all that was Finnis Dake, and he died of Parkinson's disease. I guess he's not saved. Big liar. So that's some of the things that salvation is not. And if that's your mindset, you're wrong. And if you're wrong, listen, you can be wrong about what the speed limit is on American Legion Drive. You can be wrong about who won the World Series last year. You can be wrong about a lot of things that your wife says you're wrong about. But if you're wrong about this one, it's going to cost you eternity in the lake of fire. Number one, salvation is administered by God, always by God, and never, never by man. Now, I'm just going to read through some of these verses. You can try to keep up if you want. You can jot some of these things down. You can keep, in fact, I, I would, I just love it when people take notes. Because to me, that means they're going to go back and they're going to study it later to see whether or not what I said was true or not. 
2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. Who, chose, who chooses you to be saved? God does. Through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Two things he attaches now to salvation. And you might want to jot these down or at least underline them in your Bible. Number one, through sanctification. You know what that means? That yes, when God saves you, he starts cleaning your closet out. Why did you say closet, Brother Mike? Because that's where you got all that stuff hid. That's where all your sins are hid. You put them in a closet somewhere where they're not easily seen and not easily discovered. But I'm here to tell you, if God truly saves you, He also will begin the work of sanctifying your life so that it is evident that you're saved. Sanctification, number one, and belief of the truth. And you'd be surprised at the number of people in this world who say, well, just because the Bible's wrong and I believe the Bible's wrong doesn't mean I'm not saved. Oh, yes, it does. Because if you refuse to believe what God said, how can you be saved? How can you call God a liar and believe that you're saved? The two are incompatible. They don't walk together. They're not in agreement. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. Who in here was saved when you were young? When you were a little child, you were young. Raise your hand. Who in here... Waited until you just got so sick of sin and as an adult you couldn't hardly stand yourself and God finally saved you. That's good. Now, one crowd in this church is not better or worse than any other crowd in this church. The fact that God, here's what God had to do with you. God had to let you go out, get a great big old taste of sin, let you find out that everything that you were told was actually true. And you became so disgusted with yourself and so low down in your sins and so weighted down by your iniquity that you couldn't stand it. And you, were, you may have even thought about shooting yourself, killing yourself. And then God stepped in and saved you. That was God long suffering with you. That was a very patient God waiting until such a time as you said, God, I can't do this. The thief on the cross, we don't know how old he was, but he got saved literally within hours of his own death. Is that okay with you? Is it? I, I, there was a lady who used to sit in this church years ago that said, I don't believe in deathbed confessions. I don't know. I believe in death cross confessions. Amen. While you are breathing this air, God's given you an opportunity to be saved. But I can tell you, I don't recommend it. If that's your plan, if that's your plan is, I'll wait until I'm dying of stage four cancer. Then I'll ask Jesus into my heart. Don't do it. Don't do it. Count that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, for by grace are you saved. In fact, say this out loud with me. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of. You know what some people's attitude is? I'm a gift to God. It's true. Boy, God really got something when he saved me. I tell you that right now. I'm going to do awesome things for God. In fact, Everybody's been, and I've seen people like this. In all my years, I've seen people say, all oh, the churches are doing it all wrong. 
I got saved, and boy, I can, I can really straighten churches out. I know a pastor right now that's got a guy in his church that's like that, and he's trying everything he can to run him out. And I'm not kidding you. He came to me with it and said, I got a guy, it's dri he's driving me nuts, and he's driving everybody in this church nuts. Because he thinks that he's always got better ways of doing everything and that we're all doing it wrong here. And boy, if he, he's come to me, Pastor, if you just let me start having Bible studies, I'll straighten this place out. And I told him, I said, the quicker you get that guy run out, the better off you're going to be. He's going to cause problems. You are not a gift to God. God saving your sorry soul was a gift. Somebody say amen. 2 Timothy 1, 9, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Yes, I do believe that you have been, been predestinated in a way that God knew you were going to get saved. It was not a mystery to him. And how far back did he know it? From before the foundation of the world. Look at what that verse says. He's called us according to his own purpose and grace. Now I don't go around saying, boy, we need to get, we need to get uh, uh, such and such Hispanics in our church get them saved and get them joined in our church. We need to get such and such a number of black people and we need to get some of, the, uh, uh, some of the Asian people in here. We need to get some of them and we need some big businessmen because they'll bring money into the church and we need to get these people in and get that people in. That's what Rick Warren did, by the way. I don't care who God saves, as long as he saves them, amen. And after that, I don't care where they go to church either. As long as they go to a Bible-believing church somewhere, I don't care. All I care about is somebody being saved. I want you to, maybe today sometime when you're just kind of sitting there thinking, turn TV off, and I want you to start thinking about hell and the lake of fire. Would you do that? Think about hell and the lake of fire. And picture people that you know in it. You don't want them there. Ask God to save them. James chapter, um, James chapter 4 verse 12. There's one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Now what does that verse mean? Somebody tell me what you think that verse means. I want to hear from you. Let me read it again. James 4.12. There's one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? In other words, who are you that judges somebody? What does that verse mean to you? Yes, Sister Jan. Amen. Couldn't have preached it better myself. By the way, all of this, all of this, what she said, everything that I'm saying is first of all for you to judge your own salvation first. And for me to judge mine. The moment you start taking any of this and going, boy, I know somebody who's like that. I know somebody who's like that. Wipe that off and put that on you. Am I saved? Am I right with God? Who art thou that judgest another? One of my best friends in the ministry is Mike Hutzel. He has been a mentor to me. He has prayed for me, prayed with me, been with me, and he's seen me at my worst. And you know that guy, there was a time he did not, he did not like me. He did not like me. And at that time, I went and heard him preach down at my mom's church. I didn't like him either. Had he judged me at that time, he would have judged wrong. 
He could not have known, and I'm not saying he did, he could not have known what God was going to do in my life that he later did. And Mike and I are very good friends. And we like each other now. Imagine that. There are people that you know that maybe you've judged them. And God will surprise you one day and he'll save them. Won't he? In fact, I'd say sometimes God will do it just to make you mad. Don't judge people. You, can't, you cannot condemn anybody to hell. And you cannot save anybody to heaven. So what power do you have over it anyway? Who can do that? Only God. See, that's my point. Salvation is always administered by God and not man. I can't tell you that you're saved. I can't tell you that you're lost. The only thing that I can have to go by are the fruits that your life bears. Hey, see what I'm saying? Now, number two. And this is one of those, I can cut it off anytime I want to. I may want to cut it off at two. I won't. God, through Jesus Christ, is the only way. Does that make us narrow-minded? Yes. You know, you know the kind of people I like? I like a narrow-minded airplane pilot. Right? I want a pilot who says, I'm not going to land over there. I'm going to land on the runway. That's the kind of people I like. I like a narrow-minded doctor who doesn't say, let's try every drug we got in the cabinet and see what works. I don't like that. God is narrow-minded. I'm narrow-minded when it comes to salvation. Remember what he said, Not everyone who saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of my Father. It is only through Christ. Jude chapter 1, verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. Well, you know what that phrase means? That there is only one way of salvation. And it's that way for the white man the black man, the brown man, the yellow man, the red man, and any other man and or woman in the world, there is only one way to salvation, and that is through Jesus Christ alone. Somebody say amen. Only one way. Joel Osteen gets on Oprah Winfrey. Joel, you believe Jesus is on the way to God? Of course I do. But there are many ways to Jesus. You liar, you heretic. If it was good enough to save Joel, which I know I'm not supposed to judge, but I see a lot of corrupt fruit from that man. A lot of it. There is only one way to save people, and that is through Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. That is for all of those who think that angels have a part of your salvation, that saints have a part in your salvation, that Mary has a part in your salvation, that you can pray to St. Jude, St. Joseph, St. John, St. Mary, St. Mary Magdalene, St. Ignatius, St. This and St. That. None of that junk applies. There's only one mediator between you and God, the man, Christ Jesus, and that's it. John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man 
cometh unto the Father, but by me. And I have the recording. You can find it on YouTube. Where Billy Graham has connected by phone with, um, oh, who was the guy who used to be in California with the Crystal Cathedral? Huh? Yeah, Robert Schuler. Schuler's got him on the phone, and they're both in agreement that even a Muslim can be saved through Islam. They don't have to say Jesus. They don't have to know him as Savior. They can still be saved. And Schuler said, oh, I'm glad, so glad to hear you say that. And everybody in the auditorium erupted in applause. Woo, that's so good. Every one of those heretics is going to die and go to hell. That's not what God said. Billy Graham's had a Bible in his hand. I don't know about Robert Schuler. I know Billy Graham's had a Bible in his hand before, and I know he knows better than that. I don't know what happened to him. I don't know if he went nuts or if the money got to him or whatever. But that kind of nonsense is what has destroyed American Christianity. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Acts chapter 4, verse 10. Be it known unto you all. And to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified. Boy, Peter just had to throw that in, didn't he? Who you crucified. You killed your Savior. That by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders. You know what that means? They looked at it and they said, well, that's not a good enough stone for our church. And they cast it aside. But that one stone was supposed to be the head stone of the corner. And they rejected it. When Rick Warren stood up at Obama's inauguration and prayed in the name of the Muslim Isa. That day was an abomination over this country. That man has led this, this entire country into forming and joining together Islam with Christianity. And I'm sorry, but if you have a group of people who say that God has no son, they cannot be going to the same place as the people who say, yes, God has a son. It's not the same God. Whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Underline those words, must be saved. If you are not saved, you are going to be held accountable for every sin. And I'm talking about the sins that you committed and the sins you thought of. There are thought sins, are there not? Covetousness is a thought sin. And see, covetousness, we can perform in our mind without everybody knowing about it. And think that we can get away with it. But God said, hey angel, write that down. I saw what he, I saw what he was thinking about, write that down. And you'd be amazed when you go stand before God at the number of thought sins that he had angels record that you did. You might convince yourself that you're a good person because you haven't actually stolen, you haven't actually cheated on your wife, you haven't actually killed anybody. But your covetousness, which is idolatry, Paul said, tells us that you've got an idol set up in your heart 
where nobody can see it and you have a private God inside of you that is not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God knows it's there. Nobody else knows it's there. And you can convince people for the rest of your life that you're saved and going to heaven, but you'll die and go to hell. Christ is the only way. What is salvation? Let me get through this part. Turn to Romans chapter 5. What does this mean, saved? I don't understand. And, and see, and I think, I think every now and then we should teach this. Because when I was growing up, I knew what saved meant. I knew what it meant because my mama took me to church. But out of all the people that you know, all the people who live in your neighborhood or your apartment building or wherever it is you live, if you were to ask them what does it mean to be saved, they probably could not tell you what, is that, what does that word mean. Saved from what? I don't understand. You te- tell me I need to be saved. I have no idea what you're talking about. Most, most of a younger generation, let's say younger than me, does not have, let's say Matthew's age, does not have an idea what it means to be saved. Saved from what? I don't get that. What are you talking about? I remember standing at the pharmacy there at Walmart a couple years ago. In fact, it's been several years ago, and there was a young man. Somebody said it was Good Friday, and he said, what, what is that? What is Good Friday? What does that even mean? Of course, I couldn't tell him, well, that's the day they crucified Christ, because it ain't. Between Friday and Sunday is not three days. I don't care what you say. There's not three days you can cram in there. But I did explain. I said, well, in Christianity, we believe there was a certain day that Christ was crucified on the cross for all of the sins of mankind. So we've all broken God's law. And I was trying to witness to him a little bit, and then he just kind of wandered away. So what does it mean by the, what is the definition of salvation? Why do I have to be saved? What am I being saved from? Romans chapter 5 verse 8, But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible says that sin is a transgression of the law. What law? Whose law? God's law. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Underline that phrase, saved from wrath. The wrath of God is going to be poured out, first of all, upon this world, and then the wrath of God will be cast upon everybody who has ever lived in history who has not had faith in God and trust in Him. They will spend eternity in a place of conscience punishment called the lake of fire. Do you believe that? Say amen. Do you want to go there? Say, oh no. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son... Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So if someone asks you, what does that mean to be saved? Well, number one, it means, and you can make it personal. I broke God's laws. Let me tell you about some of the things I've done in my life. And you can tell them. Because they know about sin. They, they're sinners. And just as, and I, I told this to my doctor the other day. I said, let me tell you what I believe. I believe people, there are bad people in this world and they do rotten, terrible things and they will be held accountable by a just and a fair God. I told her that. She told me about a story about, she helps uh, people with drug problems. She told me about a story where there was a guy out in his pickup truck who was dying of an overdose. Come to find out, and he died in the parking lot. Come to find out his mom was giving him the drugs. And I said, that's the kind of people that do wrong, bad, sinful things. We all do them. And she said, yeah. And I said, there has to be a punishment for sin. And there is. 
It's called everlasting punishment. And I don't want anybody to have to go there. Not even people I don't like do I want them to go there. That's the definition of salvation. Hebrews chapter 2. This will be, I'll, I'll be done. For if the word spoken by angels would steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which was at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by them that heard them? He said, if ev every transgression and every disobedience receives a just recompense of reward. Who remembers Julius Hunter used to give the news in St. Louis? Did, did you know why he got kicked off television? Do you know why he got kicked off? I don't think they should have kicked him off. There was a five-year-old girl that went missing. And everybody was out looking for this five-year-old girl. Well, the family of this five-year-old girl, there was a guy that... He'd been in and out of jail, been in and out of trouble. He was on drugs, this and that and the other. Well, this family let him stay in this house. He took that five-year-old girl and raped her and then took her out in the woods and killed her and left her out there. So while everybody's looking for this little girl, she's out there laying out there dead. The police does the investigation Julius Hunter comes up on the news saying they've, they've caught the guy who did it and he goes into reading his story and he's been out of, in and out of jail, in and out of trouble, all this and that. And Julius Hunter said, as he ended that little section of the newscast, may he rot in hell. Now I'm going, yeah. And apparently the station went to him and said, we'll give you an option, you can retire or we'll have to fire you. And I guess he retired. But I don't think what he said was wrong. Listen, everybody that sins in God's eyes is just as bad as the guy who raped and murdered that five-year-old girl. Your sins will receive a just recompense of reward. You will get what you've got coming to you by a fair God, won't you? That's why you need to be saved. A God then who is not only fair, he's more than fair. And he has, instead of you, think about that guy who killed that little girl. Can he get saved? Yes. Can God redeem him? Yes. Society may not like that. But all we like sheep have gone astray. And if God can save him, he can save anybody, including you. If you won't let him save you, there is a just recompense of reward waiting for you.